Welcome back to Half the Battle. I'm your host as always, Daniel Levy, your co-host Shaq. We're going to be talking UFC Liverpool, Stephen Wonderboy Thompson versus Darren Till. And Shaq, uh, the talk's finally over because Darren Till's facing a top five guy now, and now we're going to find out what he's all about. Yeah, you know, Till has made several claims that he's the best striker in the division, so now he's going to get a, to go against the karate guy, and we're going to find out if uh, it's true or not. And the line movements on this fight has been a little crazy, so... I'm interested to see the fight, and I think Darren Till deserves, uh, you know, all the hype that he's getting because, I mean, he's going out there and he's dominating guys. He's wiping guys out. Yeah, and I mean, speaking of the line movement, it's interesting to see him go from a plus 150 to a minus 125 favorite. Uh, all I got to say is <clears throat> it's not these guys with uh, the $20 units that are moving that line, Shaq. Yeah, those are the big boys. So uh, the big boys are very confident that Till gets this done. Yeah, so I can't wait to find out if they're right. And uh, before we break down this card start to finish, just got to remind them, once again, max bet season was a complete success because every time we have a consensus max bet, it goes out there and gets the job done. This time, no sweats involved. 39-second KO for Gabriel Mowgli Benitez uh, showed Humberto Bandanai that there's levels to this shit, and uh, the five-unit max bet was a winner. Yeah, you know, that's exactly uh, what we expected. Now we move on to UFC Liverpool, where max bet season is also in full effect. And guys, once again, I don't know how many weeks in a row I've had to say it. When we say it's max bet season, it's time to get the money out. It's time to, you know, capitalize on these opportunities that we've been talking about. And it's going down again this weekend. Yeah, in case you missed what Shaq said, we have another consensus max bet this weekend at UFC Liverpool. So go to bestfightpicks.com to get that. And we'll go ahead and do this whole car start to finish, man, because first up, we got Gina Mazzani. She's minus 115, and Lena Landsberg is minus 105. Now, real quick, Shaq, Lena Landsberg opened minus 185. Now she's minus 105. All the action is coming in on Gina Mazzani. And I, I don't know if you recall that fight between Gina Mazzani and Sarah McMahon, but that didn't quite look like a UFC caliber fighter to me, Shaq. Yeah, you know, before that fight, she was uh, kind of inactive, man. I think there was a period where she might have only fought once in like four years or something like that. So she's from that uh, Alaska scene. So, you know, I really don't think there's too much talent out there. And, uh, you know, Landsberg, you know, I feel like Landsberg's got a solid game, you know, a nice tie-up game. Definitely likes to do her thing in the clinch with the elbows. And, I mean, I think uh, overall she's probably a better fighter than Mazzani now. But the thing is, Lena Landsberg's 37, 38 years old. She's not taking damage as well as she probably was in her younger days. I mean, she gets cut open easily. You know, she's just not operating at the same frequency. We saw the Pudalova fight, which was one of the biggest robberies, you know, of that year. Pudalova teed off on her at least two out of the three rounds, in my opinion. And then we saw her fight against Aspen Ladd. You know, she came out really good early. And then the second uh, Aspen got on top, she wasn't able to recover. I actually think the finished product of Mazzani is kind of something similar to Landsberg because we know in Gina's uh, second fight in the UFC that she was a bully in there. She tied her, tied a... Uh, Yan and, Wu, Yan and Wu up, and I mean, she beat Yan and Wu's ass. She landed a couple left high kicks, just like I've seen Lena land a, a couple high kicks. So I'm going to take the younger, fresher uh, fighter in Gina Mazzani. I think she's, you know, training at Extreme Couture. She's got some good people around her. I think she's making improvements where I don't think Lena's making any improvements. But I wouldn't be shocked if, you know, that solid base of Lena was able to just scrape this fight out. I think it's a 50-50 fight, but I'm going to take uh, Mazzani just because she's younger, fresher, and I think she might want it more. I mean, go watch that fight with Gina Mazzani and, and Sarah McMahon man and tell me that that's someone that belongs inside the UFC's octagon because at least Lena Landsberg at least she made it to the second round with Cyborg yeah she got both her eyes closed but she took that ass whooping like a like a woman you know what I'm saying Shaq so I mean she showed me that at least she belongs in the UFC and yeah you know we faded Gina her last fight because you saw that fight with McMahon I mean how could you not fade her and she went out there and you know she beat the the Chinese can crusher but now she's back to fighting uh the quote-unquote elbow queen, you know, you know how they get down, man. So uh, I I'm going to say Lena gets it done. We'll see what happens. And next up in the middleweight division, we got the most boring fighter in the history of the sport, Elias Theodoro. He's minus 420. The comeback on Trevor Hot Sot Smith is plus 335. Now, uh, is, uh, is the air going to take a serious ass-whooping in this fight by Elias this time, Shaq? No, man, I think, uh, you know, I think the lines, it might be a little a little steep, but it's a, it's about right. Look, Trevor Smith, even though he's won three out of his last four, I mean, I think, uh, you know, occasionally he'll have a, a performance where, you know, like, man, Trevor Smith uh, maybe might not be a jobber, you know, but then he'll come back a few months later and show you that he is a jobber. The guy is really inconsistent. Sometimes he looks like a powerhouse D1 wrestler, and then sometimes he looks like complete shit, and he gets wobbled by guys like Andrew Sanchez. I mean, to be honest, his wins are against... Uh, 
Judd Lottie, who's not in the UFC, Kamozi, who's not in the UFC, and who can't suffer takedown. So, you know, I think Elias is going to take this fight, whether it's Harry, whether it's a easy 30-27, or whether it's close and he has to scrape it out. I just think he has more heart at the end of the day. You know, even though his style is, you know, he kicks at the air and his kicks really don't have shit on him. He's very active. I'm talking about a guy that beat Cesar Mutanchi, and we see what yeah. Cesar Mutanchi's on these days. And he just beats guys by his little weasel, his Canadian weasel tactics. You know what I'm saying? He outworks guys. I mean, I had a bet on Brad Tavares a lot. That's what's scaring me in that fight for a little bit. So, you know, I respect him as a fighter. I think his effort is what's going to win him this fight. He's one of those max effort guys. And I think, uh, you know, we can fade him down the line in his next fight. And I, I, I got a good next fight for him. I love how when you talked about Elias in, in this particular matchup where he's a minus 420 favorite, and you mentioned the possibility, the possibilities of how he can win this fight. Finishing the fight was not one of those possibilities you mentioned because, as you know, I mean, look, he's going to kick the air as hard as he can, and for some reason, he's able to get away with that, win these decisions. Trevor Smith, I mean, come on, man, he had that incredible fight with uh, with Ed Herman. So go back and watch that. It was a very exciting fight. But Elias Theodoro, he's so boring that he makes Kamara Usman look like Leonard Garcia. So, you know, I, I think Elias is going to run around the ring, throw a bunch of kicks at the air. They're not going to land. They're not going to hurt anything. But he'll probably get a 30-27 as a result. But it would be nice to see the D1 wrestler go out there and, uh, you know, hump Elias and make him take plan B the next day. But it's most likely going to be an Elias decision. Now, next up, uh, I don't know who these people are, but Molly Molly the Can McMahon, or McCann, excuse me. She's minus 250. The comeback on Jillian Robertson is plus 210. Now, uh, this Molly McCann girl is getting super uh, super hyped up over there in the UK. Uh, they call her uh, Meatball Molly, you know what I'm saying? So uh, now she's taking on the redhead chick that, that won via submission in her debut. And uh, who you got? Yeah, you know, I'll probably take McCann. Look, I think the line's a little off. I I, I don't uh, have the McCann in the regards that I have for, uh, like, a lot of other prospects that got that's getting her type of hype, like, you know, a Mackenzie Dern, for example, or, uh, you know, I, I don't think she's on that level by any means. You know, I think she'll probably scrape this one out just because Robertson's still very green. But Robertson tra- puts in work every day with Dean Thomas at ATT. She trains with the former champion, Joanna. She trains with good people, So and she's 22 years old. So the more time you give a 22-year-old chick, you know, time to train, I mean, she's going to get better. I like that armbar setup she had uh, against in her debut. But at the same time, I don't know if you can rely on things like that to consistently win you fights. I'm going to take McCann by a 29-28 decision, but uh, she'll be faded down the line. Yeah, I mean, I could totally understand where you're coming from. It's also in the U.K., so in a close fight, you know, the judges are going to give it to McCann. But uh, I'm going to go with Jillian Robertson for the upset. We'll see what happens. Now, finally, we got a real fight on our hands here, Shaq, because we got the newcomer, Carlo Pedersali Jr. He's actually uh, the nephew of the famous actor. What's the famous actor's name? Uh, Bud Spencer. He is the nephew of the famous actor Bud Spencer. Go type in Bud Spencer on YouTube. He's got some great clips. So Carlo Pedersali Jr., he's minus 165. The comeback on Brad Scott, or as we like to say in Brazil, Brad Scotch, is plus 145. Now, uh, Brad was initially supposed to fight Jack Marshman a few months back. Marshman couldn't make weight. Then he's supposed to fight Salim Tuari on this card. And now he's taking on the newcomer, Carlo Pedersali Jr. Who, who you got? Yeah, you know, I think Brad Scott, you know, I think he's a nice guy, but I think he's, you know, steadily declining each and each fight. You know, in his younger days, I thought he was a little more physical. His reactions were a little faster, but I've always thought he was slow at 185. I mean, let's go back to his days when he was fighting Claudio Silva in that second round when Claudio was completely wanting out and wanting his way out. Brad was too slow to finish him, and he ended up getting taken down in the last round. And I think a lot of people have a suspicion that Brad's got some type of wrestler, tie-up artist. He's a striker. He's only won one fight by decision throughout his whole career. All his wins are by finish. He's a striker. And then, you know, his fight with Askham down there in London, you know, the loser's probably going to go home. And this was, that was his hoorah fight, in my opinion. So I think, uh, I mean, Askham was on one leg, and I thought Brad barely did enough to win that fight. He was operating at a very slow pace, slow plotting, and I think he was slow at 185. Now he's dropping to 170, fighting a slick southpaw striker from Italy who, uh, you know, pretty much schooled Nicholas Dalby uh, for the first two rounds, but he did take that fight on two weeks' notice. And I think uh, 
for this fight, he's going to come in a little more fresh, a little more turned on. He just fought a month ago. I think he's going to come out here. I think he's going to slip and rip, land something from that southpaw stance. I think Brad Scott walks into everything from the southpaw side. Go back and watch his fight with Jocko. Even in the Claudio Silva fight, Claudio was landing punches from that southpaw stance as well. I think he's just confused by that. He's claimed to like uh, fighting orthodox guys. I think he's got. I think he's on his way out, to be honest, Dan. I think, uh, you know, I think he's a mentally unstable guy. I think, uh, you know what I'm saying? I think the guy's a head case. And, I think he's got a weakness for uh, behind the ear shots as well. So uh, I think, uh, you know, he, he's made claims that he, you know, he can make more money plumbing. And I think, uh, I mean, the guy's said multiple times that he wanted to reset and, you know, go go do something, uh, go to America to train. And as if, like, he wasn't fully sure in his preparation. So I got Carlo Pettisoli Jr. by finish here. I think is going to open a lot of eyes in his debut. I think this is a solid prospect. And I think he uh, touches Brad Scott up from the outside. Yeah, you know, you know how you mentioned how Brad Scott saying stuff about, oh, I can make more money being a plumber than I could being a fighter. I remember when Tim Kennedy said he could make more money being a trash man than a fighter. Then he comes in and gets absolutely destroyed by Kelvin Gastelum. I and mean, I see this being a similar situation. Look, I know Brad Scott's only 28 years old, but between you and me, he's 48 years old, you know, in fight years. And I think he's had enough, and he hasn't really evolved that much. It's always going to be the same slow, plodding one-dimensional fighter you know he wants to throw big bombs he's a tough guy he's in there for the duration of the fight but he doesn't eat the shots as well as he used to like you mentioned those shots to the back of the ear uh especially those those temple shots he does not react to those well and i think a guy like carlo petter solid jr people don't realize how well-rounded this kid is you know on the feed obviously he kind of has a little bit of that McGregor slash Darren Till stance, you know, that southpaw stance, loves to throw that straight left. He can also throw spinning attacks uh, with his kicks. And not to mention, the kid can wrestle too, you know. Don't be surprised when Carlo Pedersoli gets those double underhooks and slams Brad Scott, and then it doesn't end there. The kid's got jujitsu too. I saw him go for a calf crank against Nicholas Dalby, and normally, you know, when we talk about guys like Mehdi Baghdad going for that flying armbar against John McDessey, throwing the fight away, this isn't one of those situations because with Carlo Pedersoli, he goes for that calf crank against Nicholas Dalby. Five seconds later, he's on top and side control. So that, to me, not just not only does it show his confidence inside the cage, but it also shows his fight IQ that, hey, if I'm not going to get that submission, I can still end up on top. So even though it's on short notice, I, I mean, I don't really see what the big deal is. I mean, do you remember that time when Chas Kelly won two fights back-to-back within two weeks of each other? Do you remember that time when Chris Lieben defeated Aaron Simpson and Akiyama, finished them both back-to-back within two weeks of each other? So why can't I... Uh, Carlo Pedersoli come out here and do the same thing. I think he's going to open a lot of eyes. It's going to be interesting seeing Brad Scott drop to 170 pounds. And at the end of the day, I got Carlo Pedersoli Jr. getting his arm raised decisively. Now, next up in the welterweight division, this is going to be really good too. We got Nordin Taleb. He's minus 360. The comeback on Claudio Henrique da Silva is plus 300. Now, I feel like they forgot about my boy, Claudio da Silva. Uh, let me let me ask you. Let me, let's do a little MMA trivia. Don't look it up. Who was the last guy that Claudio Henrique da Silva beat inside the octagon? Leon Edwards. Leon Edwards. That's a top fifteen guy right there. So if you think Claudio's some slouch, uh, you might have another thing coming. But then again, he's coming off a four year layoff. No one knows what he's been up to in that time. Nordine is a serious serious fighter. Who you got? Yeah, it's going to be a uh, tough fight because, you know, we really don't know what to expect from Claudio. He's been out for so long, pull out after pull out. The thing is, it's one of those things where I preferably want to stay out of just because even though I got Nordine in this fight all day, Claudio is one of those, you know, Brazilian weasels. Those Brazilian weasels, those Brazilian cheaters, you know what I'm saying? He's got the all the Brazilian weasel tactics. He he uh will, you know, fake eye pokes and, you know, fake low blows to get time to rest. And, you know, those guys are always hard to fight because they're not going to fight. He's going to try to take Nordine down, and when he gets on top, it's, you know, he's probably not getting back up. So <laughs> his jiu-jitsu is that good. Um, it's good to see him back. I'm going to go with Nordine, though. You know, I think if you got the line closer at the opener, you know, that's probably more suitable. But, you know... I expect Claudio to come out real heavy in the first round. I, I wouldn't even be shocked to say if he uh, won the first round, but I think at some point when he gets tired in that second round, like similar how he did against Leon, similar how he did against Brad Scott, I think Nordine will actually put him out. Yeah, it, it's interesting, man. We don't know what to expect from Claudio Henrique da Silva, but if he comes out looking anything like he did his last fight against Leon, it could be really interesting because... 
like you mentioned, Claudio is one of these guys that, you know, things aren't going his way. He's not going to just ball up and quit, but what he will do is, you know, he'll look at the ref and pretend that there was an eye poke. He'll start flopping to his back. Just think about a tractor preserve. This guy has that exact same style. High-level black belt. You know he's never lost a, a fight in his life. I mean, look, the only fight he lost, he lost via DQ. You know what I'm saying? So the guy is basically undefeated, always finds a way. But with Nordin, I'll tell you what, that 38-year-old man is uh, finding... He's finding his groove inside that octagon. He's looking the best he's ever looked. First of all, he's massive for the weight class. His leg kicks are absolutely devastating. His takedown defense is on point. Even his takedown entries. I mean, go look at that entry he hit on uh, Worley Alves. Worley had to do some serious uh, athleticism to to stuff that takedown. So my boy uh, Nordin is super well-rounded, and he probably should be able to come out here just based on the fact that I think his cardio is going to last longer because, you know, that four-year layoff, man, you know, that adrenaline dumps a real thing. So... And you just got to be careful about, you know, Claudio getting him down on the ground, about Claudio, you know, faking a, a foul and getting Nordin a point taken away. You know, little things like that. This is like a Tractor Prezeris. It's just he's not as fresh as Tractor because he ha- he, he's he been a- inactive. But the, dude, the dude's already got a top 15 win. So you don't count on a guy like Claudio Henrique da Silva. But that said, you know, it could be a situation where now he's competing in the USADA era. Nordin hits him one time and Claudio curls up and gets pounded out. It could be like that too. So I'm actually going to go with Nordin Taleb inside the distance. But... At the current price, you got to proceed with caution. Now, next up in the middleweight division, we got Eric Spicely. He's minus 185. The comeback on Darren Stewart is plus 160. Now, uh, very, very interesting fight because on Eric Spicely's best day, he can finish guys like Tiago Majeta Santos and Alessio Di Chirico in the first round. On his worst day, uh, he's uh, taking canvas naps in under 40 seconds to, to Andrew Sanchez. What do you think? <laughs> Yeah, you know, you really don't know what to get out the guy, man, because I actually think he's a lot better than, you know, his perception. It's just that I think the guy has no belief in himself. I think when things get tough, he tends to, you know, want to go home. You know, we saw when Alvi touched his neck. I mean, his last fight with Mershar, you know, the, that body kick was vicious. But, I mean, let's just put it this way. Other guys would have survived. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I think uh, he's just a little mental case. The thing with Stewart, he's also the same thing. Stewart runs himself into the ground every single fight. I mean, he pushes a pace that he simply can't maintain. And then he ends up tapping as well. So, both of these guys are very similar. So, you know, in situations like this, I, you know, probably want to side with the dog. And, uh <laughs> You know, I'm actually going to take Stewart in this one. I think he gets a hometown win. You know, I think Spicely crumbles when that pressure is, but so does Stewart. But I think he might actually get that first round finish this time because, you know, he'll have that energy from the crowd. But these both of these guys are super untrustworthy. And uh, it's unfortunate. I mean, I've seen Spicely take knees before, not just against uh, Mershaw. What about Andrew Sanchez uh, and Tough? I mean, Sanchez landed one high kick and he took a knee and quit. So you never know what you're going to get out of these guys, but I'll take Stewart. Yeah, it's interesting. I actually didn't expect you to take Stewart because I'm thinking the same thing as well. Look, I know Stewart's been tapped out in like all of his UFC fights, but what you got to understand about those fights is they were all stand-up fights. These guys were going toe-to-toe. These guys were going to war, a desperation shot, and he got choked out. But in this fight with Spicely, there's not going to be back-and-forth stand-up exchanges because Spicely doesn't have that kind of confidence in himself. If anything, Spicely's going to be shooting from a mile away. He might even pull guard and try to sweep. Now, if that does happen and Spicely takes the back or finds the neck somehow of a guy like Darren Stewart, it will be tap, tap, tap. That being said, he has to get it there for that to happen. And I actually think that Darren Stewart has the capability of keeping the fight standing. This is a high-pressure situation, which we know Eric Spicely doesn't do the best in. And I say that, and he did go to Brazil and tap out my head, but look. Maheta wasn't even training at ATT for that camp. Maheta didn't take it seriously. Maheta was like, dude, I was just in there with Musasi. Who the fuck is this guy? I don't even need to train for this fight. I can do the home gym thing for this fight. I guarantee you Darren Stewart's not doing the home gym because he's coming off three straight losses. And he knows if he loses this fight, that's the end of his UFC career. So as long as he doesn't get submitted, uh, I think Darren Stewart's got a good chance to pull off the upset. We'll see what happens, obviously. And next up in the Bantamweight division... We got Manny Bermudez. He's minus 275. The comeback on Davy Grant is plus 235. Now, uh, all I got to say is if Mark Goddard is refing this fight, be very careful with the Manny Bermudez bets because uh, Mark Goddard is Davy Grant's biggest fan. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, go watch uh, Davy Grant versus Marlon Chito Vera real quick. Yeah, you know, uh, I got Manny Bermudez in the spot. I think uh, all of Grant's is lost. 
Grant's uh, losses are by submission. He lost, he got submitted by Holdsworth, submitted uh, by Stasiak, um, and you know all his wins are by submission. So if people are under the assumption that he's you know a guy that's used to putting guys out with strikes. I think they are misled. Um, you know, he he definitely is the better puncher, but I see Manny making steady improvements, you know. A steady he's getting a little more confidence in his hands. I mean, he landed some shots against Albert as well. Um, you know, Albert definitely cracked him with some shots, but the thing with Manny is on the mat, I don't care, at least for the the early stages of his career, I think he's going to get through at least three or four fights with his little submission shit, you know what I'm saying? We, we've seen plenty of these guys come up along the way, these, and it's not, he's not like one of these leg lock guys, we're talking about triangles, we're talking about Camaras, guillotines, like all type of stuff, whether he's on top, bottom, he non-stop, he's always going, and I think Grant's going to eventually fall into something, just like how he did against Stasiak, and I think Bermudez operates on a different frequency on the mat, I mean, this kid is chaining submission after submission, and I think the second the fight hits the mat, I think eventually uh, he'll get triangled. So I got Manny Bermudez all day by first round sub. Yeah, you know, I, I think this is one of these situations where Bermudez is, uh, you know, he's a he's a poor man's version of Brian T. City Ortega. You know, it could be going super ugly on the feet. He can be getting tagged up. But as soon as uh, he grabs a hold of you, the fight will be over shortly after. And he's able to transition from bottom to top. He can sweep really well. Even standing up, he can grab your neck. Then all of a sudden, he's mounted on top of you. And we know uh, Davy Grant, even in, even in his one UFC win where he was aided by the help of his biggest fan, Mark Goddard, he still got his back taken. He still got caught in leg locks. Uh, it's just that, you know... Mark Goddard uh, pretended that Cheeto grabbed the fence, and then he reset the mid-submission. So as long as uh, Mark Goddard's not refing this fight, because look, Manny Bermudez could have a deep Darce choke locked in, and uh, Mark Goddard will find a reason to stand them up. Oh, he's grabbing the fence. Oh, he's grabbing the inside of the glove. So as long as Mark Goddard's not refing this fight, I think Manny Bermudez is going to come out here and tap out Davy Grant within the first two rounds. Now next up in the featherweight division, we got Arnold Allen. He's minus 280. The comeback on Mads Burnell is plus 240. Now, shout out to my boy Arnold Allen for coming through and uh, handing Ma Maquan Amirkani his first ever UFC defeat. You know, we cashed in on that plus money. Now he's coming in there against Mads Burnell, who's a very, very big guy and a strong grappler. And uh, I'm very in I'm very intrigued by these odds. What's your opinion? Yeah, you know, um, you know the line... Uh... I think it should be a little closer. Um, I do agree with Ar Allen uh, being favorited. You know, Burnell, they're both young kids, but I think um, Allen's, you know, experienced pretty much everything there is to experience in the uh, on the in the octagon. Even though Burnell, you know, he had his debut against Tractor, Tractor Brazilians and went 55, and I thought he did well in the fight up until he got uh, finished. And then, um, you know, his last fight with Mike Santiago, where I mean they were in the clinch for 15 minutes. So I'll go ahead and say if they clinch. I think Mads Burnell gets the job done all day. Now, even though Burnell has some periods of, you know, flopping to his back, he generally gets on top. But let's speak about Arnold Allen's last fight because some of the shit I saw in, uh, with him and Maquan, now I understand Maquan's takedown attempts are relentless and nonstop. But, I mean, some of those scrambles, I mean, he would have uh, Maquan all the way flattened out head down and then he would go for a guillotine doing stupid shit making young mistakes both of these guys are young fighters i think allen's a little more of the crisper young fighters i really don't have the facts to say that if allen does stuff takedowns the the later in the later rounds of this fight does mads Burnell have the stand-up skills to hold his own and to make this look close we really don't have the facts because it's uh his fights have really been all on the mat. They call this guy the submachine on the local scene. So, you know, I'm going to take Allen by, you know, a split decision, a close decision. I think Brunel's going to fight well, but I just think the stand-up advantage is going to uh, take Allen, uh, uh, you know, a long way in this fight. But I would not be shocked at all if Brunel pulled this upset off. I think his tie-ups are a lot better. I think his just basic wrestling's a lot better. I think, uh, you know, he should chill out with the uh, flop into his back. But Mike Santiago is a bigger guy than Arnold Allen, in my opinion. And, I mean... Mads drained the hell out of that guy, but he also did show up five pounds overweight, so he did have that advantage. So, but I'm going to take Allen by split decision. And if he shows up uh, five pounds overweight here, it'll be interesting to see uh, how the results go because I'll tell you what, Mads Burnell is a guy with a lot of potential. Once he gets it together, not a lot of people are going to be able to get back up from bottom when this guy's on top of them. He's a super, super strong wrestler. He's able to chain his submissions, but he's just in that phase right now where he's getting that seasoning 
inside the octagon. And a kid like Arnold Allen, he's due for his first UFC L. It's right around the corner. It could be this weekend. But right now, I simply feel like he has the more well-rounded skill set than a guy like Mads Burnell because let's say he is able to keep the fight upright. He is able to stuff the takedowns of Mads Burnell, maybe even get up from one or two. It's, uh, it's worlds apart standing up. I'll tell you that right now, Shaq. And it could be one of those situations where, you know, Mads gets the back in the first round. You know, he's trying as hard as he can to finish the fight. But then he gasses out. Round two starts on the feet. Mads starts flopping to his back. And Arnold can tee off on him. So it comes down to how much progress has Mads Burnell made between his last fight and this one. And that's going to be the determining outcome here. So as of right now, I think Arnold Allen is the more complete product. And that should aid him to victory. But if Mads Burnell has finally turned that corner... Like I said, once this guy gets it together, he's going to be a super dangerous grappler to deal with. And he's going to be submitting guys left and right. It's just a matter of if he's there right now. So if you want to take a one-unit shot at plus 240 to find out if he's there, I don't blame you. I just simply feel like Arnold Allen is the more complete product right now. And for that reason, I will pick him for the victory. Now, uh, you know, we're just going to act like Jason Knight versus Makwan Amir Khani is the co-main event because people give a shit about that fight a lot more. So let's talk about Neil Magny versus Craig White. Neil Magny is minus 650. The comeback on Craig White is plus 475. So Neil wouldn't take a fight with Jorge Masvidal, but he's taking a fight with this kid, Craig White. And uh, we looked up Craig White, and let's just say uh, the odds aren't too far off, Shaq. Yeah, you know, well, firstly, Jorge Masvidal couldn't make the the welterweight limit. You know, Jorge's been looking like a little fatty out there. So when we say uh, a fatty, we're talking two twenty two thirty. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, uh, and to be honest, I think he he should relax. Um, you know, Magny's earned his spot one hundred percent in my opinion. You know, I mean, he's beat Hector, he's beaten uh, Kelvin. Kelvin, he's beaten Johnny. Josh Condit, Johnny Hendricks, uh, Hung Yu Lim. I mean. He's been a lot of guys. He's means, been, means Garcia. <laughs> guys put in work. So uh, Magny definitely deserves a spot. I agree with the line 100%. I actually think it could be a little steeper. I think Craig White's, you know, even though he's got 21 fights, I think he's still green and loose. You know, he, he has a puncher's chance, of course. But Magny's one of these guys that's used to taking punishment, used to coming back. At worst case scenario, if White did land a punch, I don't think he can maintain, you know, the second and third round to win a decision. I think, you know, he'll fold under the pressure. I see Magny having his way with him. You know, Magny. He's not going to come in there and do anything stupid and, you know, exchange sloppy. He's going to stick to his, you know, what we like to call his little pussy fight. And he's going to, you know, jab, jab, run, move and play this thing safe and get the win. And I think he will. Yeah. Craig Wyatt, first of all, he's huge for the weight class. He's about six foot two. He's also only 28 years old. You look at his record, you see the record of a journeyman. But that being said, he's so young that it could be a case like uh, Dan Hooker, where Dan Hooker's also around the same age, and he also has you know seven to eight losses. You look at that record, you're like, man, you know what's up? What, what what's the deal here? But it could be one of those situations where you know he didn't have an extensive amateur career. He jumped straight to the pros, so he had to learn his lesson literally on the job. And now with Dan Hooker, we're finally seeing the potential. So I'm not comparing Craig White to Dan Hooker. I'm just saying as a 28-year-old man, that could be the case here. But I saw his last fight, and, you know, he's getting taken down by these absolute scrubs. And, you know, his game is very – it kind of reminds me of Brad Scott. You know, it's kind of plotty. It's kind of goofy. So Neil Magny is the kind of guy that – you know, sometimes he underestim- underestimates his opponents and he pays for it. But, I mean, it, when you underestimate Lorenz Larkin, yeah, you're going to pay for it. You could probably underestimate Craig White and get away with it. But that said, Neil Magny, he's had over 10 UFC wins. The guy's a consummate professional. He's probably going to come out here and take care of business. I feel like the jab is going to be a big weapon. I feel like the running away is going to be a big weapon. I feel like the body lock. Because don't forget about my boy Neil Magny. He's got takedowns too. I mean, yeah, everyone takes down Carlos Condit, but not everyone takes down Kelvin Gastelum. And he did that multiple times throughout their fight granted greg white is a way bigger guy but i, I still think uh, neil magny finds a way to win as a minus 650 favorite so yeah i'm uh i'm taking him to win this fight here now next up in the middleweight division we got tom breezy's minus 360 the comeback on daniel dad's army kelly is plus 300 now you know you know we got much love for my boy dan kelly if you've been listening to half the battle for a while you know we've had him on the show Great guy, great fighter, great story, total winner, finished Antonio Carlos Jr. Now with Tom Breeze, he hasn't been inside the octagon since UFC uh, 199 when he fought Sean Strickland. You know how long ago that was, Shaq? That was a very long time ago. He was scheduled to fight Oluwali Bangboshe, who is arguably uh, one of the worst fighters in the history of the sport. 
and he weighed in, they stared down, and then on fight day, Tom Breeze pulled out of the fight due to anxiety. Now, if you're pulling out due to anxiety against, uh, you know, a complete can, like Oluwale Bang Boshe, what's going to happen when you're fighting uh, your father? You know what I'm saying, Dan Kelly? Is, is he going to bend him over and spank him? Yeah, you know, it's it's definitely alarming. I mean, anxiety, that sounds like, a you know, an internal issue, like a head issue. I mean... Uh, anxiety <laughs> anxiety of what i mean you're up at 185 i mean you got to move up your weight class you couldn't weather a two-minute I mean, storm i mean it's pretty simple with alo ali just cover up for two minutes and you'll win and really you really don't have to cover up for two minutes these days so <laughs> but uh i mean yeah that is alarming so you know uh you know, I, I think Tom Breeze is 100% the better fighter here. Dan Kelly's getting old. I mean, his last fight, he got caught with about 100 right high kicks to the face, and they were at a very slow speed from Elias, and he kept walking into him, which lets me know that his reactions are slowing down. He did get KO'd stiff the fight before that against Derek Brunson, so I, I think his uh, best days are behind him, you know, obviously. Um, you know, but he's still a tough guy, and Breeze, man, it, you know, if you got the opening line, you know, and you wanted to see, then, you know, I, I think he will win the fight. I just think at 185, he's going to be a lot more healthier i think he's a way better boxer i thought he was doing good against strickland but you know strickland is 19 and 3 he does have a nice jab and i think uh tom breeze was legit sick i mean if you looked at his face at the end of that fight those are the type of guys that you can tell need to move up a weight class so uh, i'm gonna go with breeze here but the the anxiety thing does alarm me man like anxiety of what <laughs> you know what i'm saying what do you have an anxiety for you know what i'm saying you're not cutting all that weight <laughs> you're not, you finally got the 15 pounds and so nothing should uh be wrong you know so that alarms me so it's kind of you know surprising to see him uh this high you see that many people back him but i think they'll get the job done yeah you know it's hard for me to pick against a guy like like Dan Kelly, especially at plus 300 odds. I mean, he always finds a way to defy the odds and go out there and, and beat these young guys up. But at the same time, eventually that has to come to an unfortunate end. And, you know, the Derek Brunson fight was super sad for me to watch. But then the fight with Elias Theodora, you know, God, that guy Elias, you're fighting an old man and, and you're, you're swinging kicks at the air and running away from him like a little bitch. At least my boy Tom Breeze isn't going to run away from him. Like, you know, at least Tom Breeze is going to give him a real fight. So one thing I like about Tom Breeze, Tom Breeze is his hand fighting. You know, he's able to parry really well. He throws shots straight down the middle. You know, that's what I was worried about when I bet Sean Strickland to beat Tom Breeze. And then I max bet Tom Breeze to beat Bang Boze, and he pulls out on fight day. So now with Dan Kelly, I feel like it comes down to, you know, Tom Breeze can catch him in that first round and put him out. That's for sure. So... That might be a possibility. That might be what happens. But if somehow Dan Kelly is able to weather that first round storm, take it into the second and third round, start clinching him up against the fence, start landing those left hands, mix in a couple of, you know, judo sweeps and judo throws. I mean, you remember that time he finished Carlos Jr. He so uh, don't put it past him to teach another young lad a, a valuable lesson here. So I won't be surprised, and I'm rooting for Dan Kelly, but most likely just being realistic. Tom Breeze gets a first round knockout, but I'll be rooting for my boy Dan Kelly to to take over late and break the young kid. Co-main event of the evening, the real co-main event of the evening. We got Jason the Kid Knight. He's minus 150. The comeback on Maquan Amir Khani is plus 130. Now it's interesting the direction that both of these career, both of these guys' careers have gone in. You know, Jason Knight he comes into the UFC. You know, obviously he had the short notice loss, but since then. He put together some very impressive wins against guys like Dan Hooker, against guys like Chas Skelly. When he finally got that step up against Ricardo Lamas and uh, Gabriel Mowgli Benitez, he unfortunately wasn't able to get it done. But now he's got another step down in uh, Makwan Amir Khani. Makwan hasn't fought since the time we faded him successfully against Arnold Allen. We know Makwan's a super one-dimensional fighter, but he's good at that one dimension. You think he's going to be able to get it done against uh, the very exciting Jason Knight? Yeah, you know, um, you know, Knight, uh, before his Lamas fight, before his Mowgli Benitez fight, you know, I had even said, I think this guy's taking too much damage. I think the ride is gonna, you know, end soon. And, you know, it's unfortunate because I didn't bet either of those guys in those fights. But, um, if you go back and listen, you know, I fully said that Mowgli Benitez was gonna, you know, 
uh, take him out. I mean, he's been completely wiped out his last two fights. I mean, completely wiped out. And I think uh, the best days are behind him. Now, that doesn't mean he can't win the fight because, you know, he has had a little time off. But I think uh, the Jason Knight that everyone knew and loved is gone. I don't think that guy's ever showing back up again. Now, he's got a good opponent here because Maquan is what we like to refer to as a one-dimensional, you know, staller. He's just going to fucking act like he's going to strike and he's going to duck under and shoot right for your legs and he's going to keep doing it and keep doing it. He's not going to strike. He doesn't punch he has no confidence in his hands the thing is i think in terms of long-term run who's uh who has room to improve and who doesn't i think makwan has more room to improve uh, i think knight i don't think he's improved i don't think he's going to improve anymore i just think that you know throughout his win streak he took like look we can go back in the alice fight and it was a great fight he won and all but let's not forget he got taken down four times he uh got wobbled in the third round his fight with, uh, you know, Dan Hooker, first two rounds, great. Third round was a little sloppy. He started flopping to his back. And, you know, when you're fighting a guy like Maquan, I, I don't want a guy that does that. I don't want a guy that has any rubber guard. I don't want a guy that, uh, you know, wants to get back up to his feet and let the hands go. Now, I think Knight 100% has a better punching. But, you know, if Maquan was ever going to have success on the feet, I mean, I would think it would be Knight because Knight, he throws the same combination over and over, and he doesn't move his head. So this is a 50-50 fight, in my opinion. I think Jason Knight's tougher. I think he's a better puncher. I think he's an overall better fighter. I just don't have the 100% trust in him that when Maquan does shoot, is he going to... Because Maquan's going to keep shooting and reshooting. Is he going to go rubber guard one time? Because I think the second he goes rubber guard one time... If I'm a night better, I'm walking away from the TV. And I don't think he's going to ever operate on that, that frequency that he was operating, but... I think he will scrape it out. I just think Maquan is terrified to exchange punches. But I wouldn't be shocked at all if uh, Knight took his third L in a row here. This is a step down in competition, but I think Knight might be taking a step down in performance as well. And uh, it's a 50-50 fight I don't want nothing to do with, but I'm going to take Knight. Yeah, you know, Maquan Amir Khani is a guy that I've always been looking to fade. And it's funny because when I watched his regional footage right before his UFC debut, I was like, dude, this guy's fucking terrible. So I actually go in there. And, you know, this kid, Andy Ogle, you know, he went to, he made it to the third round with Charles Dubronx, you know. He he, he beat Grisby at the time when that actually mattered. You know, he went the distance with a couple tough guys. Like, Maximo Blanco at the time was super tough. So I was like... Like, Andy Ogle can probably take care of this guy, Maquan Amir Khani, who, you know, is super one-dimensional and, you know, ain't that great. And uh, Maquan goes out there and knocks him out in eight seconds. I was like, oh, fuck. Luckily, my boy uh, Two Men Off came through against Musoki that night. But, you know, it was uh, one of those situations where I was like, damn, uh, maybe I should have thought twice. So then, you know, I take the next fight off when he fought Masio Fullen. I let him go in there and choke him out. Then, uh, then we got back to fading Maquan, and it didn't work again. He beat Mike Wilkinson barely, but Mike Wilkinson performed so bad that they cut him right after the fight. So then they put him in there with Arnold Allen, and then I was like, okay, this is my opportunity to fade this motherfucker, Maquan Amir Khan. He's not going to get away with his bullshit here. And you know what, Shaq? He almost, almost got away with his bullshit there, but we actually cashed the plus 110 underdog Arnold Allen in that spot. But now we're coming in there against Jason Knight, and... Man, if I was promised the Jason Knight that fought Chas Kelly, I'd be all over him here. But I'm not promised that. I'm not guaranteed shit because, you know, it's one thing to take an L. It's one thing to take two Ls. But it's another thing to take the amount of unanswered shots he took against Ricardo Lamas, against Gabriel Mowgli Benitez. We know Gabriel is absolutely devastating because if you didn't see our max bet winner against Humberto Bandanai, I mean, he butchered the young kid in under in under 40 seconds, Shaq. So, three rounds of that. so imagine three rounds of taking those shots. And, you know, I know Knight's one of these guys. He's too tough for his own good. Lamas absolutely destroyed him. But the thing here is there's not really a punching a punching threat with a guy like Makwan Amir Khan. You know, he's not known for... All he's known for is uh, trying to get you down on the man. I'll tell you what, he's got nice double unders. He's uh, He's got nice lateral drops. He's got nice low singles. He's able to pull guard and sweep. He, he does the whole bit, you know. He's, uh, he's very good with his weasel tactics. Now it's about, is Jason going to get weaseled? Jason got weaseled against uh, Tatsuya Kawajir, but that was... You know, on two weeks short notice coming off the couch. I've also seen Jason Knight go in there and tap out guys like Musa Kamanayev, who's one of the best Russians on the regional scene, and that was with a full camp. So this is a full camp here. 
it comes down to how long can Makwan Amir Khani stall Jason Knight on the mat. If he's not able to do it for extended periods of time, Jason Knight's going to come away with this win here because he's much more well-rounded. And I do feel like his takedown defense improved big time from the Kawajiri fight to the Chaskelly fight. That Chaskelly fight, those scrambles they had in the first round, I recommend all the Half the Battle listeners to go back and watch it because it was truly a thing of beauty. And if you need you know, some kind of indicator of how this fight could potentially go down, Maquan doesn't hit as hard as Chaskelly, but... They are going to be scrambling all over the place, and we saw Jason was able to get the better of the of those exchanges against an NAIA wrestler. So now against Makwan, who you know he's a Finnish wrestler, we'll, we'll see what happens. But uh, I'm going to go with Jason Knight here. I think he's the more well-rounded guy, and as long as you know one of uh, Makwan's friends, like Mark Goddard, isn't refing the fight, I don't think he'll be able to stall out on top too long. And I think Jason will get the opportunities to get uh, you know his strikes in. So I'm going to go with Jason Knight via decision. Main event of the evening, and man, it's interesting how the line flipped on this one. Darren Tilly's minus 125, the comeback on Stephen Wonderboy Thompson is plus 105. And like we said earlier at the beginning of the show, I know those uh, $20 betters didn't flip this line, Shaq. Yeah, this is, a, this is a great fight, a fight I've been looking forward to for a long time. You know, after Till beat Cerrone, you know, a lot of people were discrediting that win, saying, you know, Cerrone is, a, is old, which is true. You know, Cerrone is old. Cerrone has been taking a lot of L's. But, you know, the way Till put him out, I mean, Till didn't need a punch, and Till really hasn't been eating any punches besides the, the third round of the Dobby fight. I'm going to go ahead and here and say it. I think Till might actually fight for that title, man. I think he might be the best striker in the division. I think Wonder Boy, this is a typical sense of, you know, this is how the game goes. You you don't go from, you know, when you fight for the title and you lose twice and, you know, you're number one. You generally don't stay at number one. You generally go from one to three to five to seven to nine to 11 and then, you know, so on out the door. I mean, that's just how the game works, you know what I'm saying, until you retire. And, uh, you know, I'm going to go ahead and say I don't think Wonderboy wanted this fight. I mean, six well, he didn't six, want six, six months ago, I mean, you remember they tried to strong arm him and, and his dad said we're not interested in the fight. You know what I'm saying? You know, they, they think that their win over Jorge Masvidal is this big deal. But let's be honest here. Over 10, 11 guys have solved the Jorge uh, Masvidal Listen, puzzle. Jorge's got an incredible <laughs> personality. He's very fun to watch. I'd love, love to hang out with him. Incredible guy. But uh, who gets robbed more than a 7-Eleven check? Jorge Masvidal. And, I mean, he got wiped out in that fight. And, look, those guys respect Wonderboy. They they start backing up, and they give his karate too much respect. Till moves forward, man, and he's way too big, in my opinion, for Steven Thompson. I think Steven's chin is declining as well. Now, I think Steven's a super tough guy. He showed his heart against Woodley. I actually thought he won the first fight against Woodley. The second fight definitely went Woodley's way, in my opinion. And, I mean, some of the damage that he took in those fights, man. And, you know, George wobbled him, but George is an old man. George is also, you know, on the tail end of his career. George is 230 pounds. <laughs> exactly. You know what I'm saying? I, I, even though the name value is good, I just don't see – I see guys outside the top uh, 50 team taking Masvidal out here in a second you know what I'm saying (laughs) you know what I'm saying so uh I I I think uh this is Till's time I think he's too big for Wonderboy I think he is the best striker in the division and where I see him catching uh Wonderboy is where Steven backs up into the fence we know that when Steven backs up into the fence his hands are consistently down he's a karate guy and I mean he's kind of switched his style up to completely tip and running you know he used to be that guy that would throw thunder and spinning head kicks and knock guys out occasionally now he's strictly to the tip and running and I ex- fully expect him to uh, do that here I wouldn't be shocked if he tried to tie uh Tie uh, Till up, but we saw how Till's tie up defenses against Cowboy Cerrone hit him with a double leg. He got back up. He shrugged him off in the takedowns. He reversed him. He turned him around. So I think uh, Till's too big. I mean, I see why they call him the gorilla for once. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I think at some point when Steven backs around, you know, on that black line where his back's against the fence, I see, you know, a nice little 1 1 2 landing. And I think uh, it will form him. Now, I think he can also win a decision. If I think if he can drop him a couple other rounds, and you know, I, I just think uh, in a strictly stand-up fight, I really don't see Till losing too many fights. The only type of guys I can see him beating him, beating him in a strictly stand-up fight, you know, a Pons, you know, he's even gone on to say he thinks the tougher, the tougher fights are the Colbys, the Usmans, the Myers. You know, I got a lot of respect for Thompson, but I just see uh, this being Till's time. 
in his hometown, that energy from the crowd, Steven's enemy number one, I don't think he wanted this fight. I think they're underestimating him. I think they say he only has a left kick and a left hand. <laughs> I mean, if you believe that. <laughs> but the thing is, that's really all he needs. I think it, I think he's that. I think those two weapons are just that good. It's just the setups. It's his presence in there. He's a gorilla. And I think Steven is 35 years old. You know, he had a great run, but you go, you don't go, you don't stay at number one. You, stay, you go from one and you go down. So I'm, I'm going to take Till, man. I think he gets a knockout somewhere in the second round. Man, su- such a good fight. And I see the overconfidence in, uh, in Steven Thompson. You know, people said that Darren Till had all these lackluster performances, which, you know, is actually not true because when you 30 25 a man, how is that lackluster if you understand what you're watching? And they also fail to neglect the fact that Wonder Boy has also had his fair share of lackluster fights. I know I know they forgot about that Nashon Burrell fight. I know they conveniently don't bring up the second Woodley fight. Oh, because it's Woodley. Therefore, you know, oh, it's the champ. It's like, well, did you see him not pull the trigger in his second title fight? Another thing about that fight is that fight was, when you really think about it, that fight was fairly simple. I mean, Woodley would literally just back into the fence and they would literally just play. That's why the fight was so boring. And that's why, you know, Woodley Willie doesn't get these big money fights is because Willie sat with his back against the fence and they were literally just trying to play a game of if Steven could return the uh, slip the return shot and then it was just a tip and run contest really man yeah so I mean let's talk about uh Darren Till's entire career because we watch it all he comes into the UFC against Wendell Oliveira and I, I know it's a jobber but look I saw some good parts of his game there first of all I saw him swim for double underhooks good takedown defense his tie clinch is on point his elbows in the ground and pound are absolutely disgusting. Then he goes in there, he fights uh, Nicholas Dalby, puts an absolute clinic on him. I know his shoulder popped out. And uh, look, you know, we can count that as his first L. Everyone has to take that first L, and even his first L was still a draw. You know you know what I mean? That, that shows the kind of winner this guy is. And, you know, he did kind of quit a little bit in that third round. Maybe it was the pop shoulder. It maybe happens. Maybe it was the first L. You know, I remember when... I, I, when Wonderboy quit against Matt Brown. I, I was in attendance when, when Wonderboy <laughs> uh, got the shit being out of him by Matt Brown. So, you know, everyone's got to take that vet lesson. And, and you, know what's, you know what's the common theme here is that that was Darren Till's second UFC fight and that was uh Stephen Wonderboy Thompson's second UFC fight so they both had to take ass whoopings in their second UFC fights it was what it was then uh Darren Till he takes two years off he has the shoulder surgery and then he comes back in there you know he misses weight by five pounds against Jess and you could tell like you know he was coming on he's had the rust he still goes in there and drops the kid five times puts an absolute clinic on him and people hold it against him that he didn't finish the fight he 30 26 that man don't bet inside the distance let's put it this way (laughs) Jessen Ayari hasn't been back since. <laughs> we never heard about Jessen Ayari ever again, okay, Shaq? So, uh, you know, don't hold it against him that he absolutely killed that man, but it, it saw the final scorecards. Oh, man, big deal. Then the fight with Bojan, you know, because I was wrong, and, and I thought that the Ayari fight wasn't that impressive, but then, you know, I go back and watch it and study for this fight, and I was like, oh, shit. This kid put an absolute clinic on him. The fight with Bojan, he put an absolute clinic on Bojan as well. You know, I feel like, when you're not getting past that first gear and you're just cruising, you're just having a good time, you're taking in the environment, you're doing all these things, you know, no one knows who Bojan is, let me just play with him for three rounds, let me get that octagon experience, and 30-26 is the man as well, but then... Then is when he gets the step up. Then is when it really counts. Then it's when he has to fight a guy like Donald Cowboy Cerrone. And let me ask you something. If you are not a top five fighter, what happens when you fight Donald Cerrone? You lose. Every single time. That's Donald Cerrone's history. If you are not in the top five, you are not beating Donald Cowboy Cerrone. Because I hear all these people talking about how, oh, he beat Cerrone, big deal. Yeah, you know the guys that beat Cerrone? It's usually only champions, former champions, and top five guys. It's ne- I've never seen some fucking scrub go out there and beat Cerrone. And it's not just about beating Cerrone. Did you see how he beat Cerrone? Did you see his physique in that fight? I want everyone listening right now that's on the fence on this fight. Open two fight pass windows. One of them have uh, Till versus Cerrone. On the other one, have Till versus Bojan. Tell me the difference in that physique. Tell me how much better he looked when he went in there against uh, Cowboy Cerrone because he looked legit like a fucking 205er in there. And if that's what he... If that's how he shows up for big fights, I can only imagine what he's going to look like here against Wonderboy Thompson. And we know Wonderboy likes to back himself up against the fence. We know that Darren Till likes to pressure guys up against the fence. And I think that's the, that's going to be the key to victory here, that large southpaw stance. People think he's only got a left-hand side shot and this and that. Don't get me wrong. 
The left side shots are going to be big weapons in this fight, but I feel like this is going to be the one where you see the full toolbox, and I think somewhere along the way, he's going to back him up against the fence. That chin of Wonder Boy is going to lift up in the air, and uh, it's going to be a nice straight left down the pipe that floors uh, Wonder Boy. And, you know, people act like Wonder Boy can't be stopped. I mean, did you see Jake Ellenberger drop him? Did you see Woodley drop him, you know, five times in their series? He can be dropped. He will be dropped. I got Darren Till the Gorilla to secure uh, his title shot here against the very well-respected Wonderboy Thompson. Now, uh, Shaq, before we hit up Kyle Marley for the Big Marley Minute, we just got to remind them that Max Bet season continues this weekend at UFC Liverpool. And, man, I mean, Max Bet season has been fucking going well back to back to back to back weeks in a row. Alex Oliveira against Carlos Condit. Marcus Maluco Perez against James Bachnevik. Jack Hermanson minus 135 odds against Talis Latis. And most recently, Gabriel Benitez. He open at pick a mod shack. Goes out there. Knocks out Humberto Man in 39 seconds. And guess what? It doesn't stop there. We got another consensus max bet this weekend too. Not to mention uh, Kellen Vieira at minus 120. Um odds when you know she closed minus 220 or something like that and uh you know yeah we got max best season i mean once again alert alert it's max best season max best season means easy money on the board we got easy money on the board this weekend in uh liverpool max best season means i mean the hit rate i mean i don't even have to say i mean it's just time to stop you know hesitating stop you know missing out on these opportunities you know we are the ones that you know identify the mismatches and we got a mismatch at a great line and do we did and like we already told you guys you know if, if you're sick of me you don't like my attitude that's fine go go hit up Shaq's individual package man we don't take it personally or if you just want to deal with me you know uh you see that that hundred uh unit record that i just posted up that's fine hit me up too bestfightpicks.com now we gotta hit up kyle marley for the big marley minute and joining us now on the big marley minute is big marley himself kyle how's it going man Hey, not bad. Coming off a winning week, so I'm ready to get it again. Yeah, you know that Gabriel Benitez consensus max bet winner. You know, you know how we do around here, Kyle. Easy game. That's right. So, man, this main event between Darren Till and Stephen Thompson line has flipped. So now, what I gotta know is. Look, the value in DraftKings is obviously on Till because they opened him the dog there. He's the favorite in real life. Is this one of these situations we're putting Till in our lineups? Uh, yeah, I think the line flip basically makes him a cash game lock. So you could either go Till by himself there if you wanted to or still stack it. But I don't think you go Wonder Boy in cash alone anymore, uh, just based on the line. So I think Wonder Boy would be the better GPP play because everyone's going to see the line movement, everyone's going to see the value on Till, and they're going to put him in their lineups. So he's going to be super heavily owned in GPPs. Uh, and I'm going to have some of them as well. I'll probably, I might even be even with the field because I do want my Till exposure. Uh, but... Thompson could be the sneaky play here. He, if he gets a first round knockout at a low ownership, that's gonna that's gonna put you past a lot of lineups. Well, between you and me, he ain't getting a, a first round knockout. But Jason Knight is taking on Maquan Amir Khani, and uh, we know Maquan loves to get those takedowns. He loves to stall out the action. Jason Knight was a very hyped up guy until he took those two recent setbacks to you know two top twenty five guys. Which way are you leaning? Uh, this fight is the mid-range fight there is there's no like 8100 price guys um so we got 8300 versus 7900 here uh so i think you're pretty much gonna have to use it in a lot of lineups to find a build that you like um and i, I think i would kind of just rather go with uh that is my last spot let's say i got five people i like but i have 8300 dollars left i like night but if i have 7900 dollars left i like amir khan so I like both sides on this one, but it more is the last spot in my lineup for whoever can fit. Uh, I can see a high score for either one of them. I think there's going to be a lot of takedowns for Americani, but I keep seeing Knight getting a guillotine on one of them and putting them to sleep at some point. So I definitely want uh, shares on both sides, but my pick will be Knight. So Neil Magny is taking on the newcomer, Craig White. I know the price cap on Neil Magny is super high. Now, the question is, is he going to go out there and outperform that salary cap? And the reason I ask is because you know Neil Magny is the kind of guy to play it safe. So it might actually be a disappointment if people put him in his li in their lineups. Yeah, I have a real hard time paying $9,500 for Magny against anybody. Uh, but this is, this is the time you would do it uh, because he will probably be a little bit under-owned because his name is Neil Magny and he only averages 70 fantasy points a game. 
Uh, but he's fighting a guy on short notice who's 14 and 7. Uh, so Neil Magny could get a late first round stoppage, and that could rack up a lot of points. Uh, so if you can if you can afford them, I like them in your lineup. But at the same time, if you don't really like many dogs and you want a bunch of favorites in your lineup, I also don't hate a punt with White, and then you could fit four or five good dogs in your lineup that you will like. So I don't love this fight. It might be a fade, or it's, it's another one of those. If I can afford Magni, I'll throw them in. If I need to punt on White, that's what I'll do. But I'd, uh, if I was making one lineup, I'd probably fade it. So Arnold Allen and Mads Brunel, it's an interesting one because Arnold Allen obviously is the more popular guy. He's had good results in the UFC, but Mads Brunel, he's got that grappling game. I've heard Kyle Marley say takedowns, win points, and win uh, championships on DraftKings. I know that's what Mads Brunel wants to do. You think this could be a sneaky underdog? Yeah, it could be. Um, my problem here, though, is Allen is my pick. Um, I would, I've thought about betting Allen also. I uh, just haven't done it yet, but on DraftKings, he's $9,200, and he in his three wins, he scored 62, 79, and 79, so if I'm paying $9,200 for him, I want a lot more points than that, so I think he's really kind of a fade in DraftKings, and if you're going to use this fight, it would be Burnell, because if he pulls off the win, he's probably going to outscore his $7,000 price tag. And he's very cheap, so that allows other guys in your lineup. So I think uh, Brunel's a pretty solid play, uh, but he might be one of the more popular underdogs as well. So I don't know, kind of interested to see how that fight plays out on DraftKings. But Allen's the pick. Brunel, I think, would be the better DraftKings play, though. So Manny Bermudez is taking on Davey Graham. Man, I love this kid, Manny Bermudez's submission game. He seems to always find a way, a, a way to tap these guys out. Davy Grant has been tapped out many times, but he is the hometown guy. I know you like the hometown guy in their hometown. So which way are you leaning? Uh, man, I, I like the slick submissions from Bermudas as well. Uh, I don't know how he's going to get it, but I see him getting the submission. I just don't know how he's getting it to the ground. I mean, I could even see Grant taking it to the ground and losing because of it. Because I think if they start grappling, Bermuda is going to lock up a submission somehow. And if it's early in the first round, that's going to score high. Um, so I, I, I just see the submission somehow, which I'm, so I'm going to have to put him in my lineups. Uh, I just don't see how this fight exactly plays out in my mind. But I don't really like Grant in this one, so I think he'll be a full fade for me. So Nordin Taleb's taking on uh, Claudio Henrique da Silva. Nordin's a huge favorite here. Nordin's been looking amazing, but the last time Claudio fought, he went out there, he beat Leon Edwards. He's kind of a tractor Prezerish type guy. He's an expert weasel, but he's been out for a long, long time. So you putting a lot of stock into that layoff? I'm worried about it, so I think I'm probably going to try and avoid him if I can. Uh, he's $7,100 on DraftKings, so we already talked about Matt Burnell. He's a thousand. I mean, $100 cheaper. I would rather just go there personally. So unless you think Silva's getting a lot of takedowns, maybe you want to fade to leave. That's the time you want to play Silva, but that's not for me. I think this is going to be a favorite or fade for me. If I can afford Taleb, I don't mind him. Uh, I'm just worried about him paying off his salary. But he's my pick, and it's probably going to be a fade on Silva. So I'm going to keep it short and sweet on this one. The newcomer, Molly McCann's taking on Jillian Robertson. I mean, look, Jillian got a submission her last fight. I'm sure she scored over 100 points, and uh, McCann's unproven. So we thinking the dog here? Yeah, I think uh, I'm probably going to fade this fight just because I don't really care about it. But if I was making one lineup and I had to throw one of them in it, I'd go ahead and just throw Robertson and hope she can get another submission. Uh, and at $7,300, you can afford a lot of favorites in your lineup. So uh, I would say dog or pass on that one. Elias Theodore versus Trevor Smith. You know, Elias, uh, he's a minus 420 favorite. I guarantee you he's not going to exceed his price tag no matter what he does in this fight. <laughs> yeah, he's $9,400. Um, I think really the only good thing I can say about him is he will be super low owned in DraftKings. So if you want to be contrarian, uh, I think he's probably a safe win. So you could throw him in your lineup for that reason, but... This is probably my fate of the week, man. I, I'm less interested in this fight than I am that last fight that we talked about. So this is another dog or pass, uh, but it's more likely a fate. So real quick, what did you say the price tag was on Elias? Elias is $9,400. Okay, well, he's definitely not going to surpass that. But here, here's my question for you, a little uh, 
trivia slash trick question. Not really trivia, but look, what I'm trying to get at here is <laughs> when Raquel Pennington lost to Amanda Nunes, she scored me 50 points. Am I guaranteed that Elias is going to at least score me 50 points when he's, you know, throwing all those kicks at the air? <laughs> I, I would say, yeah, with a win, I would say, yeah. But in a loss, I, there's no way he's scoring 50 points in a loss. Yeah. You know, it is what it is. And last but not least. Yeah, I'm not interested in it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Gina Mazzani is taking on Lena Landsberg. The line's completely flipped. Gina's now the favorite. Lena opened the favorite. Lena actually made it to the second round with Cyborg. Gina couldn't even make it to the second minute with Sarah McMahon. Which way are you leaning? Uh, this is another one where Landsberg, because of the line movement, she'll be super cheap. I mean, not cheap, but uh, super low owned in tournaments. So that's. That's the only reason to go there, I think. She's out of cash games. You can't throw her in there. But on the other side, I think Mazani is a good play in cash now because of the line movement. Uh, I'm not sure, so sure about GVPs because she is going to be very highly owned in those. Uh, and I, I would just rather have her for the takedowns. Uh, if they're, if they're going to have their game plans work out, she's probably going to be the one winning with the takedowns. Uh, I think it's probably going to be a boring fight. But I would rather just get that value take Mazzani in the takedowns, um, and I'll probably be fading Landsberg. But she will be super low on, so if you want to try and be sneaky, maybe that's a way. It's just probably not for me. Well, Kyle, that's why you are the DraftKings guy for half the battle. Always a pleasure, man. Next week, we got the return of Jimmy Rivera. He's taking on Marlon Marais. I know we can't wait for that one. The fans can follow you at Big Marley 3 Kyle, any message for them before we talk next week? I got head-to-heads posted, so come see me if you want some action. Yes, sir. Add him at Big Marley 3 on DraftKings and challenge him. Uh, my boy uh, Kyle Marley will take on all comers, right? Yeah, bring it. Let's go. All right, Kyle. Have a great day, man. All right, man. You too. Good luck this weekend. And once again, that is why Kyle Marley is the DraftKings guy for half the battle. Oh, he's killing it. You know, it's funny because last week was our first ever, you know, we, we talk about consensus max bets between you and I, Shaq, but... Kyle Marley got in on the action. He max bet Gabriel Benitez, too, and that was our first ever real consensus max bet on half the battle between the three of us. Yeah, that's right. Well, Shaq, now we got to talk about the fight to watch and the fighter to watch. So what is the fight to watch for UFC Liverpool? My fight to watch is going to be Jason Knight versus uh, Maquan Americani. I mean, if Knight loses, this is uh, three in a row. And, I mean, if Maquan wins, you know, I'll get to uh, fade him his next fight. So it's a very important fight for me. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, I think Knight will still keep his job if he uh, does take three in a row. But uh, I think uh, just the animosity I've been hearing, both guys are going back and forth in the hotel. So that's the fight to watch. Yeah, I hear that they uh, had to get separated. I hear that Jason Knight was in the hotel and Mach 1 was like, you flew all the way here just to get knocked out in the first round. <laughs> and they had to get separated. So that's definitely one of the fights to watch. I mean, Jason Knight especially, always exciting. But for me, the fight to watch is Manny Bermudez versus Davy Grant. Look, this kid, Manny Bermudez, I could be right, I could be wrong, but we could be looking at the next Brian T. City Ortega. I mean, the way that this guy is able to find the neck out of nowhere, go in there and tap these guys out, it's truly something very impressive. And he's got a very submittable opponent in Davy Grant. And Grant. And on the other hand, if Grant can come out here possibly knock out Manny Bermudez because we did see Manny Bermudez get dropped in uh, his UFC debut. That'd be a, a big win for the for the Brit as well. So Manny Bermudez versus Davy Grant is my fight to watch. Now Shaq, who is your fighter to watch? My fighter to watch is going to be Darren Till, man, out of Liverpool. I mean, this is the biggest fight of his life. He's fighting the number one ranked guy in the world. I mean, it's pretty simple. If he wins this fight, I mean, he pretty much takes over the UK. I mean, this will be a legendary status for him, you know, to take out the number one guy in his hometown. So, and I think if he wins, he'll be one fight away from a title fight. You know, some other things got to get settled between uh, Colby and RDA, but I think uh, he can be right in there. Yeah, look, my fighter to watch is Arnold Allen. Look, I think that this is a young kid with a lot of potential. He's got a very serious record. He's a consummate winner. He's coming off some, you know, personal things that he has to get behind him. And not only that, they're not giving him an easy task at all. I mean, Mads Brunel is a super strong guy. They call him the submission machine. And if Arnold Allen can get past this test, that's going to be a big statement in the featherweight division. He could be one of your uh, up-and-coming players. So definitely look out for Arnold Allen. Well, Shaq, it's going down this Sunday, UFC Liverpool. It's going to be an early card. You know that early that early morning sweat. You know how we do it. Got a consensus max bet. Go to bestfightpicks.com to check that out. 
Subscribe to Half the Battle on iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube, and Stitcher. Follow me at Best Fight Picks. Follow Shaq at MMA Genius 05. Follow our Instagram at Best Fight Picks Official. Don't hesitate to hit us up because we respond to everything. So until the next time, let's cash these bets.